the minister, I can't tell you how blessed I feel and how fantastic this is. So thank you all for being here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Just sitting there thinking about that. Just had yeah. to say that. Ah, okay. So the theme for this month. So we're talking about the golden thread of truth that runs through all religions. Yeah, and uh, you know, our founder, Dr. Ernest Holmes, some of you may or may not know, but when he created our, our philosophy, he pulled from the greatest truths from all the major religions. And that's how it came about. And, uh, and so I chose this topic because I think that when you dive down deep underneath all religions, what is down within every single one of them? Love, compassion, uh, a devotion and a connection to God. And each of them have their own ways of doing that. And so there are many paths to God. Yeah, many, many paths to God. I want to read to you a, uh, a little passage by Father Benny Griffix, a Benedictine monk who lived for over half a century in India. And he ran an ashram for Christians and Hindus. And he offered the following metaphor. Look at your fingers. Everybody do that. Hold your hands out like this. Look at, look at the tops of your hands. You see five distinct entities, each waving in the breeze. But if you follow them down to their origin, they all merge at the palm of your hand. So too with our religions. If we just look at the top side, they appear distinct and independent and autonomous. But if you look at their source, they all come from the same center. Yeah. So, so today we're talking about the healing power of Buddhism. Yeah, the healing power of Buddhism. I found some cool photos if I can. Oh, it's not on. Okay, hold on. You can't give me the glasses. Uh, oh my goodness. <laughs> um, Chris, I might need your help because I, I think the batteries might be dead. So you are going to have to help me out. Thank you. Aren't these amazing pictures? Um, yeah, so Buddhism was a religion that was founded more than 2,500 years ago by Siddhartha Gautama in India. It's the fourth largest religion. Some call it more philosophy than a religion. Um, 408 million people actually practice Buddhism in the world. It's a lot. I'm going to talk about um, Siddhartha Gautama and the story, and some of you may know this story, but I think it's a, a really neat story. So he was a wealthy prince. He was born 500 years before Jesus. And he, for 30 years of his life, he was raised in a palace. His mother died when he was young, and he was raised by his father. And his father wanted him to be the emperor of India. And so he thought by sheltering him and by keeping him in this palace, lavishing him with everything he desired, the finest women, the finest clothes, the finest foods, and literally with a sunshade over his head, protecting him from dew and dirt and dust and sun. Imagine living that life. He did that for 29 years. And uh, suddenly one day, he got a little curious. He said, he said, you know, can you change the slide? <laughs> now I'm talking about, there he is. Um, he wanted to go out into the world and see what, what's outside of the palace. And so he snuck out with one of his attendants. And they're walking along, and he sees someone who's old. And he points, and he says, Siddhartha says, what is that? And the attendant says, mm, that's an old person. That's going to happen to you as well. That happens to all of us. When we age, that's, that's what's going to happen. Hmm, OK. They go back to the palace. The next day, they go back out again. And he sees someone sick. And he says, what's that? And he said, well, we all get sick. Everybody gets sick. Huh, OK. They go back to the palace. They go out again. They see a corpse. He looks at the corpse. What is that? Well, that's what happens when we die. All of us are going to die at some point. And so Siddhartha became almost obsessed about the suffering of humanity. He had never seen this before, and the more that he thought about it, and the more he con contemplated it, it became something that just took him over. Why do human beings suffer? And so what he did, he was actually, he was married, he had a baby. He left the palace in the middle of the night. He rode off on his horse, took off, lived like a beggar, slept on cold ground, and he was determined to figure out why do human beings suffer? 
And on his, on his journey, he met a holy man. And this holy man taught him how to meditate. He taught him how to go within. He taught him all kinds of things and ways to expand his consciousness. <clears throat> but after years of working with this holy man, he still was unable to shift this idea that how human beings suffer and why do they suffer? He left that holy man. Then he found another master to find out if he could help him uncover this answer, this question, why do human beings suffer? No answers. He left him too. Does that sound familiar? Do we do this? It's like, this person can't help us. Let's go to this person. Now let's go to this person. Uh, yeah, we do that as humans. So, so as he was going along his journey, he finally realized that he needed to just sit, just sit and meditate. So he sat under the Bodhi tree. There he is. And so what he did was he sat, he was committed to sitting there and, and until his answer came. And as he sat under the Bodhi tree, what he realized is that it's not about entering a state of nirvana or enlightenment somewhere out there. We think as human beings that I just need to reach a state of peace and then I'll be happy. Mm -hmm. I need to get to that place of enlightenment or nirvana or whatever you want to call that and then I'll be happy. But what he realized as he sat under the Bodhi tree is that this is something that is already within us. It's actually something that we can ex experience in any moment if we choose. It's up to us. It's the quality of the moment right now. And so we have turned the world into a painful place, he said, through our thoughts. Our thoughts are, is what creates this painful world that we live in. It's not the world itself. It's our thoughts that create the painful world that we see. And so it's up to each of us to reveal that Buddha essence that is within. It's up to each of us. That's where the work begins. Over 300 years ago, the Burmese army planned an attack to invade Thailand. And these Siamese monks had this beautiful golden Buddha Chris, <laughs> here it is, yeah. Um, and they had this Buddha there and it was sacred to them. So they covered it in 12 inches of clay. And so that the, the army that came in would not see it and, and not take it. Now, unfortunately, everybody was killed. So this, this Buddha stayed covered in clay for 200 years. Wow. And it was only in the 1950s when it was finally, it was moved. It was being moved from one place to another and a little piece of clay fell off and, the, and someone saw the gold underneath and then they uncovered it and this is what they found. Yeah, solid gold worth $250 million. Wow. <laughs> yeah, amazing. And so the, the story, what does it tell us about ourselves? that our thoughts, we get so caught up, like the Buddha suffered with his thoughts of why do people suffer? And he kept focusing on that and focusing on that. And it's as if it creates this covering around us, this, this covering, this clay, this, this, this darkness, this blockage that surrounds each of us. When that Buddha essence, that golden essence is right there within us. The Buddha said this, what we, are, we are what we think. All that we are arises with our thoughts. With our thoughts, we make our world. Truly, it is our thoughts. It is our thoughts that create our world, are they not? I had an interesting experience yesterday on my birthday. <laughs> Thank you. It was a great day. It was a great day. But I don't know if it was my birthday or, or what, but, but suddenly <laughs> I had thoughts going on, thoughts about various things. And suddenly at the end of the night, I went and did kirtan chanting and I had dinner with Samira who spoke here last weekend. <sighs> and suddenly I was filled with a feeling of sadness, not because it was my birthday, but because there were various different incidents that happened throughout the night that had me feel, as I woke up this morning, unlovable. Now, don't feel sorry for me, okay? No, it's not. Um, 
it's just what I, what I uncovered for myself is, is how the process of our thoughts work. So last night, I wasn't even aware of all these thoughts. These thoughts were coming in. They come in. They just kind of come. And then all of a sudden, we have a feeling. It's like, oh, I'm sad. Why am I sad? What's that about? What's going on? And so as I sat with it this morning, and what I was feeling, and what the sadness was really about, is yes, it starts with a thought. The thoughts come, and then it results in a feeling. But what's underneath that is a core belief. There's always a core belief that is impacting our life. And that is what to get access to and to dig into. And, and so it's, those, it's that core belief that has the impact on us more than anything else. And what I uncovered was for myself, that core belief was that I'm not lovable. And that was impacting my ability to <clears throat> operate last night, interacting with people and why I was feeling sad and why I was feeling the way I was. And the more that I thought about it, what I realized is that these thoughts come and our mind is going and our mind and we all have even patterns of thinking. Thoughts come and go. You're driving in your car, someone cuts you off, it pisses you off, your spouse upsets you, whatever it is, these thoughts come and go. But then there's certain patterns that we all have. Every single one of us has patterns of thought. Those patterns that keep going over and over and over again. Thoughts like, I don't have enough money to be able to pay what I need to pay for this month. I don't have what it takes to be able to find a job that will pay me what I need. I don't have, do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Right? We all, I'm just using that as an example, but right? And, and, and then every month, the same thing. I don't have this or I will never be able to. We say these things as if they are fact. I will never be able to achieve that thing. I will never be able to get the money that I need to be able to retire in the way that I want to retire. We speak it as if it is so. We speak it as if it's so. And then how does that impact how we feel? Sucky. Did someone just say sucky? Yes. Yeah, very good word. Yes. Yeah. And so <laughs> it's, it's a matter of catching ourselves in the moment. You know, the Buddha, when he sat under the Bodhi tree and he mm. contemplated suffering, when he first, first sat under the Bodhi tree, my goodness, all of this stuff started coming in. Intense feelings about suffering, intense feelings about all the things that he was dealing with in his life. But what did he do? He sat with it. He was present with it. He observed it. He didn't attach himself to it. In The Science of Mind, Ernest Holmes says this. Yes. We learn that persistent, constructive thought is the greatest power known and the most effective. If the visible effect on our lives is not what it should be, if we are unhappy, sick, poverty-stricken, we know the remedy. When we reverse the process of thought, the effect will be reversed. So it's first recognizing it, that we even have a pattern. Last night, my thoughts were going. I wasn't even aware of what was happening until I felt like crap when I woke up this morning. <laughs> I was like, okay, what happened last night? Right? So sometimes it's like that. These thoughts happen and happen and happen, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, I'm not feeling so good. I'm feeling sucky. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love what Joel Olstein said about this. Next slide, Chris. The first place we lose the battle is in our own thinking. If you think it's permanent, then it's permanent. If you think you've reached your limit, then you have. If you think you'll never get well, then you won't. You have to change your thinking. You need to see everything that's holding you back, every obstacle, every limitation as temporary. Because we as humans, we have a thought and we think it means something. <laughs> and we grasp onto it as if it's the truth about our life. Mm. 
and we live it out that way as if it is the truth. I will never be able to do that. I will never be able to achieve that. I will never be able to resolve the illness in my body. I will never be able to get rid of the pain in my back. Yeah, we all do this. Yeah. I recently worked with a young girl at CU, a career client, and she was talking about the stress in her life and saying, my God, I'm, I got you know, all this big class load and I've got two jobs and, I, and there's just no possible way that I can resolve my life right now. And I'm offering suggestions, nope, nope, <laughs> nope, can't do that, nope, that's not possible. What about this, nope, nope, that's not possible. And so she was caught up in that same energy of thinking that there was absolutely no possible way that it would be any different than how it was. And as soon as we do that to ourselves, we, have now, we are now that clay Buddha, <laughs> right? It is now surrounding us completely, 12 inches of it. Yeah, imagine that, yeah. And it's now blocked us from our true essence. It's blocked us from being able to move forward in our life in a positive way, in any positive way. In years past, what happened last night, and I don't need to get into the details of it, but in years past, I would have woke up sad and I would have stayed sad for weeks. Because that, that was, that's just what I did. I didn't know any different. But this morning as I sat there and I processed what I was feeling, it moved through me very, very quickly. And that's when I was able to get at this core belief. Well, why, why is, what's this about for me? My core belief, I'm not good enough and I'm not lovable. Hmm. So as the Buddha did, sitting under the Bodhi tree, sitting with his stuff. Let me show you a, a picture of this. Keep going. I'm going to come back. Keep going. <laughs> Keep going. One more. So this picture, do you see that? So when the Buddha sat under the Bodhi tree, serpents, snakes, Ooh. evil things surrounded him. Did he fight it off? No. He sat with it and he just allowed it to come to him and it neutralized and disappeared. That's how he was able to experience enlightenment. And that's what happens to us with our thoughts. The thoughts come in and we attach ourselves to it. <laughs> we think, oh, that thing, whatever that thing is, and we attach ourselves to it and we dive into it even deeper instead of, okay, hmm, that's interesting that I had that thought. Okay, that's interesting that that came up for me. We add the meaning to it. As humans, we love to do that. We love to add meaning to everything. And then what does that do? It sends us on a spiral downwards. Yeah. And so the Buddha sat and was present. He was present with what he was experiencing. He didn't fight it. He didn't judge it. He didn't make it wrong. And that's the other piece too, is how often do we judge ourselves for having those thoughts, particularly in spiritual communities? Oh, no, 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 don't, go, don't have that negative thought. Don't think <laughs> that. Don't go there. You're not spiritual if you have a negative thought. Don't do that. Don't judge yourself for having a moment like I had last night where the reason I was sad for three weeks years ago and I would go on with my sadness is because then I'd shame myself for it. And that's what we do. Do we not? We do. We shame ourselves for having those human <clears throat> moments. Guys, being human... It's freaking hard. Yes, it's hard. Do you know, and I have all these tools and I'm, I'm, you know, I have those moments where I'm suffering, I'm suffering too. But the difference, the difference is, is when we have those experiences, we always have a choice. Always do we have a choice. So you recognize, ah, I'm feeling sad. That's the first thing. You notice what you're feeling. Something shifted. What, what's going on right here? It always starts with a thought. What, was the, what were the thoughts that I was having last night? What were the thoughts I was just having that contributed to how I'm feeling right now? And then you wanna take it to a step further. What's the core belief that's underneath all of that that's contributing to me feeling this way? 
because it's the core belief, and this is the job of a practitioner, this is the job of a minister, is to get at the core belief. Because this is why affirmations are powerful, we say them every week, but why affirmations often don't work is because we're not getting at the core belief. We're just simply saying, I am financial abundant, I am financially abundant, I am filled with financial good. <laughs> and our core belief is, I'm not worthy, <laughs> or that. I'm not, I'm not worthy of receiving the financial means that I know that I desire. Do you see that? Yeah. So if that core belief is there in the background, you can do 50 million affirmations. It is not going to touch it. So if you're courageous enough to sit back for a moment and, and be with all of this, being with the thoughts that are in the pattern of the thoughts that are creating this, and, and then dive a little deeper, a little bit. What's the core belief? Core beliefs go back to our childhood. <laughs> My core belief of I don't feel that I'm loved and I'm not good enough goes back to when I was two. Now I've done a lot of work on this, so I know this, okay? But, but, it's, but it often goes back to when we're a child. Something happened back then that contributed to how we feel today. And we're operating on top of this core belief and we're walking around not understanding why something's not working for us. Yeah. Now the good news is that it can be shifted. It absolutely can be. How do we do that? We do that through loving ourselves. So many of us grew up in, in households where we were not loved in the way that we deserved to be loved or the way we desired to be loved or the way we needed to be loved. So many of us didn't receive that. So we need to pick up where our parents left off. We need to parent ourselves. And so when we recognize a thought pattern, we recognize a pattern that comes through us, we recognize a core belief that we are holding on to, you know what I do and what I did this morning and last night is I put my hand over my heart and I just say, I love you. I love you. Let's all do this together. Just place your hand over your heart. I love you. 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 It's such a simple, simple thing. And yet, how often do we say that to ourselves? How often do we love ourselves ever? We love our families, we love our children, we love our spouses, we love this community, and we show that. But how often do we actually love ourselves? for the human walk and for all that it takes to walk this human walk mm -hmm. and for all that each one of us have experienced. <sighs> and so <clears throat> something to think about as the week goes on. I've given you a lot so far. Chris, can you go keep going through the slides? Stop, stop back up to the purple Buddha. Right there. <laughs> okay, thank you. And so, when you notice that you're feeling down in some way, that's the first thing. Just kind of notice without judgment. Not what's wrong with me, but just noticing. What thoughts did I just have? Hmm. And like the Buddha who sat under the Bodhi tree and, and just allowed it to be there, just allow it to be there. Don't judge it, don't assess it, don't make it wrong. Just observe it like an innocent child. Oh, isn't that interesting? Huh, I'm feeling this. These are the thoughts I was just having. Okay, huh. What belief could be underneath? Hmm. Again, now, as you do this process, emotion's gonna come up, and that's okay. And so the last step is loving yourself through it. 
And this is where the affirmation comes in. And this is where being gentle with yourself comes in. And this is where you place your hand over your heart and you just say, I love you. Our affirmations, the reason they are powerful is because they always start with an I am statement. We don't say, I will be financially abundant. We say, I am financially abundant. And so it could be a simple thing as, I am love. I am peace. I am joy. So as I sat with all of this this morning, I came up with a completely different affirmation than the one that you have in your hands. <laughs> okay? Now, I couldn't change those because my admin had already printed them out. So we're, let, this is the one that came through this morning. And let's all say this together. I am gentle and loving with myself as I uncover the patterns of thought and core beliefs that no longer serve me. So being gentle and loving with yourself is the key. That is the most important thing that we can do for ourselves, is be gentle and loving. Be gentle and loving. And so I'm going to leave you with that and to continue practicing that as the week goes on. And if you need support, certainly our practitioners are here. I am here. We're all in this together. We're all walking this human walk together. And it isn't easy sometimes. And I want you to know that I get it. This is why I share my own personal stuff. I, just because I'm a minister doesn't mean I got it all figured out. So please know that I love you, we love you, and I just invite you please to be gentle and loving to yourself. So practitioners, stand in high consciousness. We're going to move into prayer now. And so we just move into this tender space this loving space that has been created. And so right here, right now, I am knowing that beautiful, magnificent power of God that walks with each of us as we walk this human walk. As we move through these times of challenge, as we experience patterns of thought, as we recognize patterns of thought, as we recognize and uncover core beliefs, I am knowing that we are guided through this process. I am knowing that each of us are, are held in the arms of the divine through this process, guiding us to uncover those things that are no longer serving us and that we are able to do it gently and lovingly like holding a child through this because as we are able to uncover this, we can be an even greater magnificent light in the world and a greater presence for those around us. As we heal ourselves, we heal the planet. And so I am so grateful for all that is unfolding for each and every one of us. This beautiful journey called life that is absolutely perfect. Every experience we have, every pain we have is absolutely perfect to help to grow us, to help to evolve us. And so I just give thanks for this. I give thanks for so, for that magnificent light that surrounds each one of us and guides us through this walk, through this journey. And so we're going to do something a little differently now. I'm going to ask you to, to grab the hand of the person sitting next to you. We're going to bring into our services a prayer. And this prayer, each week, I'm going to pick someone who's going through something incredibly challenging in their life. And this week, I'm choosing Leanne Goff, our beautiful, sweet, and amazing being. And because prayer as a community is so frickin' powerful, that we are gonna do this together. And so right here, right now, and as I speak, I want you to hold this. I want you to hold this intention for her. And I want you to know this truth for her, like you've never known a truth for anybody else. 
And so right here, right now, I am knowing that this magnificent being is filled with that light of God, that every single cell within her being is radiating with this healing vibration. The healing intelligence of God is moving through her with such power, with such grace, with such ease. It is healing every single cell within her brain. It is disappearing the tumor that is there. It is absolutely, completely disappearing. There is no trace of it. There is no trace of cancer in her body, anywhere in her body. As she goes to all her treatments and her doctors, they are now saying, my God, a miracle has occurred. And so we know this and we speak this powerfully and we hold this for her. We know that she is surrounded with that beautiful grace of God, holding her, guiding her, moving through the hands of all of her team, the team in Germany who's helping her, the team at Duke Medical Center who's helping her, the team here in Boulder who's helping her. And so we just hold this and we know this for her. And we surround her family with love. We surround her beloved Drew with love. We surround her beloved Lexi, her daughter, with love. We surround her father with love. These beautiful beings who are walking this journey with her. And we know that they are surrounded and comforted by this presence. And they are held and they are loved. And they are supported. And so we hold her, we hold her as part of this community and we embrace her and we know without a shadow of a doubt that she is healed, that there is a miracle that is taking place for in God all things are possible and we don't have to know how it's going to happen. We just know and declare that it is happening right here, right now as I am speaking this. And so we give thanks for this. We give thanks for the power of the divine that knows all things, that healing intelligence that knows all things. For there is nothing that God cannot do. And so we let this go and we allow it to be and we declare it to be so. And we affirm this together by saying, and so it is. Amen. Let an angel